And now we turn to Reza Hasna. Well, good morning, everyone, or good evening. Um, thank you for those comments, Alex. It provides a great overview of the region. Um, I want to zoom in a bit more on the Chinese case, and in particular, looking at Xinjiang. Um, notably for the first two points Alex mentioned, looking at economic development and the rise of institutions or weak or strong institutions in the Chinese case. Um, what makes the Chinese case really interesting is there is a rapid economic development, uh, inclusive in Xinjiang. Furthermore, uh, we are dealing with a state that has increased uh, its sort of institutional footprint. And so far, there are strong, it's a very strong institutions uh, that it's um, in terms of capacity building. So what we can suggest is a few points. First and foremost, in Xinjiang, uh, if you look from the mid 2000s to maybe mid 2010s, we've seen a rise in f flash ethnic violence and, and, and rise in ethnic tensions. In other words, uh, the Chinese, in the Chinese uh, sort of situation, we do see ethnic tensions rising. Um, and it's been not only in Xinjiang, but we see this in Tibet and other parts of China. Now, the key question really is, is why are these tensions rising? And what is the state's response to that? And I think it really gives us a good background to understanding where we are right now. So what explains these tensions? Well, the prevailing sort of wisdom is three things. One, there's ethnocultural no cultural repression. So the state's policies limit religious practices. Uh, the second thing might be perhaps the authorities are slowly phasing out the use of ethnic languages. So in Xinjiang, uh, in Tibet, uh, many of the flashpoints in China for ethnic minority management, we see ethnic languages are being eroded. They're not being taught in schools. Uh, the third sort of reason would be negative commodification representation of, of ethnic minorities in particular. Um, so we see these three reasons in particular uh, explains these tensions. Now, there's a fourth reason, and this is socioeconomically rooted. And in fact, I would suggest to you, um, this is the main reason why we see these, this rise in ethnic tensions, particularly in, in the 2000s. Simply put, um, we see that um, ethnic minorities in, in Xinjiang, the Uyghur population, and the other sort of minority groups in Xinjiang uh, are not benefiting from China's rapid economic development akin to the dominant population, the Han population. So it's really interesting when you look at the statistics, you find that um, ethnic minorities have higher levels of education in Xinjiang, um, but when it comes to income, when it comes to wages, when it comes to their representation in high status, high paying jobs, they're not doing very well. So let me put it to you in a different way. Uh, if you're a young individual in Xinjiang, growing up in the early 2000s, uh, what you do find is you are generally highly educated or you ha have a greater educational sort of um, uh, level than the average population within the region and notably in relative to the Han population. Um, so you get a good education. When you get to the labor market, you're not getting the same jobs that Han people are in your own region. And so what you find is there's a sort of a psychological break. You find this increasing uh, sort of revisiting into religion. So religion becomes a proxy here for ethnic minority tensions and ethnic minorities, a sort of um, um, lack of labor market outcomes. So ethnic tensions, again, is for these reasons. Now, what's really interesting is the state's response to this. Um, there's a soft policy approach and a hard policy approach. So the soft policy approach is what you saw in the last few years, uh, it's a state increasing funding to building and upkeeping mosque in the Xinjiang. We see um, the state is investing in religious institutions. Um, and, and the idea here is to create this sort of um, peaceful sort of coexistence between the Han population and the Huyghur population. Of course, um, what we saw as a soft policy approach in itself did not necessarily work. There was still this rise in ethnic violence or potential ethnic violence. And there's an increasing rise of ethnic tensions using of various proxies. So what the state um, actually did was that it's hard policy approach. And as Tom alluded to, there's more uh, surveillance. Uh, so there's more re-education camps. Um, and I mean, estimates suggest it's between 30 to 75 camps in Xinjiang. Uh, so effectively, the hard approach is this sort of security apparatus. There's a social management system. Um, Xinjiang is now divided into security zones where party members are assigned to each zone. And they're surveilling various activities that are threatening or potentially threatening the social stability. So there's a few ways to actually understand this. Um, one is there is a rise of ethnic violence. So all the statistics and models illustrated that. Uh, the state attempted to respond to it in the ways that it knew. So camps, um, 
or re-education centers have often been the tactic utilized. This is not a new sort of phenomenon. They've always had re-education centers. So what you're finding then is that the state is, is increasing that in scale and scope. So it's using that as a tactic to try and curb the potential for ethnic violence. So on the one hand, um, we can suggest that, well, the state needs to respond. Is the response um, adequate? Is the response uh, in line with its R2P sort of um, convictions? That is the sort of question we need to really um, look at. On the other hand, it might be worthwhile looking at alternatives to try and reduce ethnic tensions. And it might be worthwhile to look at other jurisdictions' experiences to reduce uh, sort of ethnic tensions. So that's where the Chinese case is at at this, at this present point.